Look at me always running late. Uh, good evening. I'm a bit nervous tonight, sorry. Uh, thank you for coming out tonight for the uh, <laughs> for the Wheeler Centre you double just booked. made that up. <laughs> no, I have, I've got <laughs> chase. That's fact you were saying. Yeah. No, I said I'm always that. nervous, but you would never know. That's yeah. what I said. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Until you tell and everyone. And now I've told yeah. everybody, look at me. I'm not what nervous. What an idiot. Uh, welcome to the Wheeler Centre for, I feel better now, for Double Booked with uh, <laughs> Tajir Winch and Tony Birch. First, I'd like to acknowledge that we are gathered on the unceded, stolen land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I give my respect to the Elders past and those keeping culture in the present and those who will be the Elders of the future. These are trying times. Society, rather than working towards increasing equality and addressing the issues of the past, seems to be going backwards. It is a privilege and honour to be introducing two authors who I admire so much. Tarajan Winch is a Radjuri author, now based in France, whose debut novel, Swallow the Air, and short story collection, After the Carnage, have won many awards, critical acclaim, and the affection of readers. Her second novel, The Yield, which is this one right here, is about an Aboriginal elder and his granddaughter. It's a story about returning to country and reclaiming language. Tony Birch is a poet, activist and academic, as well as a much-loved novelist, He's a short story writer and Wheeler Centre regular. His new book, The White Girl, which is right here, is a story about the stolen generations and is set in 1960s rural Australia. It's a story of Odette and her fair-skinned granddaughter who she must protect from authorities at all costs. And my name's Claire, Claire G. Coleman. I'm a novelist and a poet and an essayist, and I've got a book out later this year, but let's not talk about me, about them. Well, I've just talked about me, but you know what I mean. <laughs> okay, um, I've, got, I've got, a, got some questions written down, but feel free to use my questions merely as jumping off points to go nuts, because um, we've got an hour to talk. Um, both your stories are about the importance of family in Indigenous culture. In, um, in my re reading, I felt you both had a lot to s said a lot about family and how family pivoted to cultural survival during the genocidal apocalypse. How important are family, particularly grandparents, to the holding of culture? Um, <laughs> um, not to mention it in the book, but to say something that I've always um, made a strong claim on. Um, in Victoria, so where we are now, the assault on um, Aboriginal people was very ferocious um, from first contact with Europeans. And by the establishment of the separate Victorian colony in 1851, many, many Aboriginal people had been exterminated. Whole clan groups and language groups had been exterminated. And after the 1861st Aborigines Act, um, the majority, not all, but the majority of Aboriginal people were increasingly incarcerated under the missions and reserves system and that was then under, underpinned by the infamous 1886 Half Caste Act which attempted to exterminate Aboriginal people by a form of blood quantum um, caste legislation. The reason I say that is that in the sense of power, the, the power of um, colonial violence is that most Aboriginal people by the late 19th century were either living off country or were living on country in a very limited capacity, that is, in an incarcerated situation. So if we took the notion that the, the way of dispossessing Aboriginal people was to steal land and take land, we would say that the colonial project in some senses was very successful or to that point was. But my argument is that the, from the late 19th century into the second half of the 21st se 20th century, sorry, the assault on Aboriginal people was on families, on those people on the missions and reserves, on families that had been, um, that had fought to stay together. And I think from that period of the mid-19th century onwards, 
the attempt to exterminate our people was through destroying family. So I think that um, the colonial governments right across Australia come to realise that the greatest strength of Aboriginal people is family, and I mean by that extended family and community groups, and to end the so-called Aboriginal problem for all time, which we were referred to constantly, was to destroy that family group and, of course, to do that by destroying the autonomy of women, controlling women's bodies, um, controlling women's biological ability, in other words, to decide who, the, who they might have children with. So from the perspective of non-Aboriginal people, governments knew how strong family was. And from our perspective, and what does lead to why I wrote this novel, is that yeah, family is family is the foundation of, of our survival and where we are today and when we look around the country and our people doing remarkable, remarkable things, none of that would have occurred if it wasn't for that incredible strength of people at the local level on country for the last 200 years. Um, definitely in referring back to the book, in terms of the elder aspect and holding family together and keeping culture together. I was inspired for one of my main characters who tells the story of language by one of our elders, which is Stan Grant Senior, um, who, and that's the whole purpose of the book, is to shine a light on the work he's done by revitalising a language and keeping a whole the whole of the Wiradjuri people together by basically keeping our mother tongue connected back to country. So... Yeah, the whole, I think both of our books, with Odette um, as the matriarch and Poppy Gondawindi as the patriarch, are holding the family together despite the past. And it's interesting, I was thinking when I was walking down here, that one of the, when you think about, well, where are we now today as writers of this, is that both in Poppy and Odette, they're not recovering um, knowledge, they are the custodians of knowledge and in being fiction writers although both of us I think really looking to the past and history is that we are being given the opportunity to to create stories out of the, the this knowledge so we're not rec we're not involved in a recovery project we're witness to the remarkable role of um, Aboriginal custodians who have held knowledge um, I was in Geelong on Tuesday night and I'd written extensively about an Aboriginal woman, Bessie Rawlings, who wrote for 40 years for struggle for her community of Framlingham. And I'd written about other people as well and I'd been able to give those families the documentation, but I'd never found a direct descendant of Bessie. And when I was talking about um, the white girl the other night and I talked about that Bessie Rawlings was one of my remarkable hero figures, like um, Stan Grant Senior um, for Tara's book, this woman came up to me afterwards and she was crying. And um, I thought, my gee, I didn't think the talk was that bad. <laughs> um, and she was um, Bessie's great-great-granddaughter, wow. And she had never seen the letters. And for her to hear about what her great-great-grandmother had done, well, she'd seen a couple of letters, sorry, was for her to endorse the fact that these women were great fighters. Well, that, that um, connects back to... Um, my family as well, because um, in back of my ancestral country, my extended family are re restoring a, a particular rare dialect of the Noongar language through stories that were collected by a great-great-grandfather who none of us had ever, of course, spoken to him, but given his knowledge to anthropologists. Now, um, both of you mentioned museums and anthropology both as a, as a potential form of violence against Aboriginal people, but also as a potential form of um, source of knowledge. Um, do you, um, what do you... What do you have to say about the, uh, the idea of anthropology as violence and as a source to recover culture from? Actually, there's a scene... Did you... You read the whole book, huh? Yeah. Did you see yourself in there as um, a character? No, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. You are. Ooh. <laughs> oh, OK. There's a... <laughs> I, I thought I was better looking than that, but there you go. 
Yeah. Do you remember when we were in London in 2014 and we went to the British Museum? Yeah, I do remember that because she played up. You were playing up? Yeah. We were at a, we were at a museum exhibition which had a lot of Aboriginal artefacts on display, artefacts that our communities had fought and are still fighting to have returned. And um, I think it was Tara who played up being a Wiradjuri woman. I said, you go and take some photographs, which there were all these signs not to photograph, and I'll, I'll disturb the guard by asking him really dumb questions. <laughs> and so I got his attention and was asking, oh, look, you know, how do you clean these glass cases? Do you, <laughs> do you use Windex or what, what's happening here? <laughs> and Tara's taking photographs, and then he sees her taking photographs and says she can't take the photographs. And then another guy who's Moose, the wonderful writer Omar Musa, said, and I still remember, I remember. This, she can do this, she's a Wiradjuri woman, and the guy goes, what's the Wiradjuri? <laughs> Which showed how ignorant he was. Yeah. But yeah. no, I, I didn't know that was... So you know, when Missy and yeah. August go to the museum, and she says, take a photo of me doing this, because you did tell me to do that. Yeah, but I, I didn't think it was... So me. you're Missy. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what do you think of anthropology? I mean, it's... It's horrible. The repatriation of, of artefacts needs to happen faster. Um, it needs to be taken seriously and it needs to involve communities and we need our own museums run by our own people and that's basically what I'm talking about in the book. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting that there... Are t there uh, it is the only complexity here is that in, in The White Girl... There's a scene where Odette goes into the museum and she sees a couple of terrible things. One is she sees this horrible diorama of Aboriginal people and this plaster cast of a so-called Aboriginal man, woman and child and they look so cartoonish and a bit freakish and that's off-putting enough because she sees these boys laughing, schoolboys and them pointing at her. But then as she backs away from the diorama, she crashes into a glass case turns around and is confronted by the full skeleton of a which says Australian Aboriginal woman. And people may not know this, but in this building, when I was even a teenager, up until the early 1970s, the skeletal remains of Truk and Ninny were displayed to the public here in the in the, the old hall around the corner. So that I would come in here as a schoolboy and see the skeleton of an Aboriginal woman in a glass case and think about what that represented would be. I could only then think about the death of my mother or my grandmother. It would fill me, fill me full of fear. So that scene where I get runs out in horror, it was to give recognition to so many Aboriginal people going through museums around the world and seeing not only objects that are stolen, but seeing until recently human remains on display is, is horrific. The only counter to that is, and we were talking backstage about an essay that I've written, which I won't talk about, is that I had um, a wonderful friend, Patrick Wolf, who died very suddenly two years ago, who was a pommy, an English guy who came to Australia, trained in anthropology, and he was a remarkable person. So I think that some people can overcome the negativity of that, you know, the European canon, and there have been some people who have been able to both work in that discipline and answer back. And there are Aboriginal people working that way, but that's a very difficult task and it, it does nothing to overcome the horrors that Aboriginal people have experienced through the behaviour of anthropologists. And, and yeah, we know that Baldwin Spencer, who was a trained anthropologist and has buildings named after him all over the place, was the, you know, the, the, the architect of the child removal policies for the Commonwealth in the early 20th century. So... It is a it's a terrible legacy that we have to um, confront. You actually both talk about bones a lot. Mm. Did you find that? Yeah. Yeah, and the and like the pain in the marrow of the bone. Well, th I think that's interesting because one of the things that Tara talked about in her conversation. So when Tara was in conversation with Maxine Beniba Clark, I bought the book that night but hadn't read it yet. And one of the things that Tara talked about was in relationship to your work, um, 
Melissa Lukashenko's work, Kim Scott's work, and I would imagine coming up in your work, Claire, thinking about your book, is that I think there are so many common elements that we're dealing with because it sounds weird, but it, it's, it seems to be it's our time to confront these issues. So whether it be human remains, whether it be the... I mean... I blame the zeitgeist. That's the question. Because I do... I've written poems and essays and other small works where the, the concept of the Aboriginal bones and country have become a, a big thing. And, of course, yeah, Kim mentions bones. You've written about bones. Tara's written about bones. Everyone's bringing up bones at the moment. Could that just be the zeitgeist for Aboriginal people right now to talk about bones? Um, you know, um, there's a wonderful poem that was written by a, an Aboriginal Wurundjeri poet, Billaberry, in the 19th century. And the, the poem is titled, We All Become Bones. And that has always been a, a really strong reference point for me. I think it's more the, the, the sense that the relationship between the human body and country, as in the earth, is, is intertwined in our way of thinking, whether it be intellectually or, or spiritually. So I, I actually do think it's, it's a constant. So I reckon if we went back in the, the, you know, the body of Aboriginal writing, going back, you will find it coming up. And it's not, it's, and I think this will come up in your book. Uh, um, it, if we go back to the First World War, and we average, so I did a lot of work on Aboriginal women's writing during the First World War, and they say the bones of our sons lie in the fields of Flanders. So it's, it is a constant refrain, and I think it's about, it's also about your body of a loved one being stolen and taken and laying somewhere else. And then the idea that if bones are, are part of someone's, of someone, there's someone's physical essence, essence that survives in their bones and culture and personality survives with the bones, that means someone can't come home if their bones off country, which comes back to the museums again. So it's... I think actually, I think he was saying in the yield, because Bob is talking about how nothing ever dies and he's talking about electricity separate from the body. Mm. And the issue wasn't, the, one of the biggest issues was bones being forgotten, mm -hmm. bones being discarded, bones being ploughed over in fields, mm. and then bones being removed without regard. So, like, I think of putting... I don't know. I think there's importance with... Oh, it's hard. I'm oh, sorry. I'm just on a rant. <laughs> you help me, Tony. No, you, know, you can analyse my no, book way better than I am. I don't think it, it's a rant because I think that what he's doing is that it's the way of also... I mean, that dictionary project is, is like that gathering together of knowledge. I think the same way when you think about the dispersal of bones, the dispersal of bodies, the attempt by humans is to gather together those and bring them back together. I think it's, a, I think it's all about regathering, re reclaiming and reconstituting knowledge. Because yeah. that's what the dictionary is doing. Well, are, are, are bones the, uh, say, are words the bones of culture? Uh, uh, are, are, are bones, or are words the bones of culture? I think so. I believe so. I believe they're the bones of our future as well as in, in Australia. I believe that we must, like, it's our absolute imperative as Australians to embrace our native languages. It's the way to understand the landscape, to understand history, to understand culture in a sensitive way. I, I can imagine, you know, children, two, three, four-year-olds learning languages in classrooms and imagine their sense of identity as Australian in 20 years from now and not just Indigenous students but all students. Yes, I think it is. And yeah, I me. think it's interesting that the English language tends to not only by the loss of other languages, traditional language, the English language can really flatten out the value and depth of culture. So when I did some teaching in Dublin, and I'm not sure this might have come up for you with, with French, but I was able to sit down with a couple of Gaelic speakers so when they explain a word, like might be walking across the ground, um, when they translate the Gaelic to English, it's not just walking across the ground, it's connecting my body with this earth. So what we might think in English is walking 
in Gaelic, it's connecting my body with the earth. So Bruce Pascoe, when he's doing work on this in language, in his work and in your work in, in the yield, it's language is, is not just, it's not an explanation of just the basic. Straight translation. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's about the poetry and the depth of intellectual understanding of what you're doing. And I think that's the key. So if we were thinking of something like the challenge of climate change or the challenge of ecologically protecting country, by knowing an indigenous language, the local indigenous language as Poppy's doing in your book, you say, okay, this is what country really means. This is what we really need to do to value country because it's, it's giving you a deep time understanding of place rather than say, you're just walking across the ground. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> well, this, this comes to one of my questions I wrote down because I, I found something striking about both your books. Because um, you're talking about language, maybe learning an Aboriginal language will teach people the importance of country, and that's possibly true, or probably true. Now, both of you in your books um, have an act of, well, mention of the act of penetration of country through mining. Tony, um, there's a quarry, quarry town in, in uh, the White Girl, and in the Yield, it's all about protecting country from, my, um, from a mining company. How important um, do you consider it to be to protect country from mining? Is it is mining more than just a uh, threat to land itself? Is it a culture and existential threat to Aboriginal people as well? I think it's a metaphor as well. Yep. I think it's not just about looking at the environmental devastation, and I'm anti Adani, I'm sure Tony is too. And but it's a metaphor for for that digging um, digging out the heart of us, I think. That's why it always comes up. What about for you? Well, in the book, um, it's interesting because they take work in the mind because they can have freedom. And one of the things, it's that bind that Aboriginal people are always in, so that there are things that you're offered which relieve you of one immediate Financial stress, freedom, yeah. but the long-term problems of, of what you're engaged in comes back to you. So what happens in in my book, even though the, the mine is a past event, the quarry is dead by the time the, the book begins, we do know that the old people, when they hear the dynamiting of the, the stone quarry, they know that that is destructive. And I think at, at the level that Tara's talking about, not just that it's blowing something up, but what it's doing to people. And of course there is a, we know there's a mining accident that is an outcome of that. The other reason it's in the book, and this is what people wouldn't know, but it's the thing around the book, that idea is based on a place outside Stall called Heavily Quarry. Heavily Quarry is a industrial ruin, a wasteland in the middle of a national park, which if blackfellas had left that mess behind, we'd be sprayed all over the press. So it's an industrial mess in the middle of a national park, and the quarry stone is a stone that was used to build most of the public buildings in Melbourne. So part of that was to think about all this destruction of Aboriginal country built these temples, the post office, the town hall, the parliament, and Aboriginal people not only lost country because of it, but got nothing out of it. And I think you know, there's enough people who have done very good work on the mining industry, and every time someone says it's invaluable for an Aboriginal per community to have a mine, and you people in the city, you latte-drinking middle-class wankers, what would you know? What we do know is there's a long-term, very few Aboriginal communities get much financial benefit out of mining, and they tend to lose a lot. Well, my, my country um, down the south coast of WA is all screwed by mining. Yeah. Yeah. Except for the national parks, it's all mining country. Yeah. Perhaps it's only a few families that benefit as well. Yeah. Like Sorry? Perhaps there's only a few families, like in the Pilbara, that benefit as well, not the whole community. Yeah. And the Pilbara's um, you, um, interesting because most people don't know this, but the, um, Federation Square, the, the pink stone on Federation yeah. Square is from the Pilbara. Yeah. So they dug up stone in WA and brought it here to build a public square. Mm. That is absolutely ridiculous. Which is, again, about <laughs> language. It, there should be another way to talk about walking across Fed Square. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should talk about Fed Square in a Pilbara language. Yeah, well, I can't, but <laughs> no one will understand you, but you can go ahead and try. 
Um, and um, of course, being both your books being about family and particularly about grandparents. Mm. Uh, Tony, your grandpa grandparent, I've met one of your grandchildren at least. Um, Tara, your parent. Um, I'm a parent as well as a grandparent. Ob obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, is it important um, for, I suppose, uh, is it important for um, Aboriginal people nowadays to try and shield your own children from the intergenerational trauma that of, of the colonisation? Is it possible and is it important? I wouldn't, well, I wouldn't shield my children from anything. Um, I have five kids, so I have four daughters, and they're all really tough. They've all been what we would think would be successful, but they're very tough and very resilient, and they're that way because they've never been shielded. Um, and having said that, I, you know, I, I didn't make them watch horror films every night like the Australian National Anthem or something. Um, <laughs> no, I don't think you should. I, I was very lucky. Um, I grew up in a house of where there's incredible violence for many, many years at a level that I never thought about it until I had kids and particularly with my grandkids. At one level, I can't imagine my people surviving it, but the other level, we've never, ever in our family ever shied away from talking about it. And some people find it, why would you? Is it a bit morbid? Is it a bit sort of self-indulgent? Are you... Um, are you sort of fulfilling that notion of a culture of victimisation? And I don't think any of those things are true. I think in my mum's case that she's never, we've never hid behind the truth and it's been the embarrassment of our, some people in our family. Um, so in my, in my piece in Growing Up Aboriginal in Australia, I wrote about my dad being a very violent person. And you know you're giving people ammunition because this is writing about an Aboriginal man who's violent, so people say, oh, this is what they're like. But then I also wrote about his recovery. But no, I, w I would never want to do that. And I, I think if we were to do that, we would then, I don't know, because I think Tara would have a really interesting response because Tara, your daughter has grown up largely in another country. Um, but in my case, say with my grandkids, I wouldn't want them when they're you know, older to, to uncover this past. Because I think the trauma we experience is often when we uncover horrific events, events that are revealed to us and we, we, we knew nothing about them. I mean, that's the trauma of colonisation, is the obliteration and hiding the facts of history. So, no, I, I think it, my kids were, um, from a very young age, sitting at the same table with the adults and weighing in when they wanted to, and I think it's made them a lot stronger for that, particularly women, you know. My daughters wouldn't take a backward step. They won't take second fiddle, they won't be shouted down by men and I think it's because they just see their right to speak and have an opinion is just natural. And yeah, my daughters, people say your daughters are so opinionated. Of course they are. And, yeah. I'm so gl and they now, the only thing is when you get to my age, they tell you uh, your time's over. You know, <laughs> sit in the corner and, and feed your grandson. <laughs> so, so uh, Tara, do you talk to your daughter about the her culture yeah and, and, her and the trauma of colonization do you talk about that absolutely and she knows that that exists in her family history in one part of her family history and i think i think in a lot of ways the reason it took you know 10 years to write this book is because i was trying to write about everything you know we're trying to write about all the issues and one of the big ones that has broken my heart um is about youth mental health and youth suicide and I kind of, when the book was done and it was, okay, I can't tinker anymore, it's got to go to print, there was that, um, they say, are oh, you relieved? And it wasn't. Yeah. It's, I don't know if you feel this, Tony, or you, Claire, but there's like a heartbreak that you didn't say enough, yeah. that you didn't address enough of our problems, you couldn't fit them all into a pretty thick book. Yeah. And then I had to reckon with myself and say, no, you know, language is so vital to our mental health. So in some way, inadvertently, I did address it. The idea of rehabilitation, about connecting back to country, connecting back to culture, rolling those words on our tongue. It is a, a healing balm for, for many people, especially mm. from drugs and alcohol.
and I hope it's a, you know, the whole intention of the book was to write it for my father who didn't grow up with language, who grew up in a boy's home and there is that, that there's a pain there mm. that exists in our family and I wrote it as a gift to, obviously Stan Grant Senior did all the work with the linguist John Rudder but I just expanded that because I know my dad wouldn't ever sit down and read a non-fiction book or a dictionary. I had to give him characters to root for and mm. so he can listen to the audio book and learn language. And it's working. The other night he, he drove up from the bush from Wagga with his new girlfriend. <coughs> Hi, Gabby. <laughs> <laughs> she's really nice. <laughs> and, um, and she's really into the language too. And we downloaded the... The apps, you can get Wiradjuri, Condobal Incorporation have created apps, they're free. And we were teaching him language and talking about the book and Dad just wanted to know all the insults, <laughs> telling us to get out and and now I get texts all the time in, in, in Wiradjuri language. Like, I'm fine, it's good, I've done my thing. If, if Dad likes it, Uncle Stan Grant Senior likes it. And if readers and especially young people can connect with and realise the importance of connecting back to country, culture, land, family, and family at the heart of it. And it's interesting, again, thinking about the, the lists, the, the dictionary and the lists at the end, reading through those several times, it, it's, I mean, there's a real poetry to, to the words, but it goes to your, your question about how do you deal with trauma or how do you engage with children or whatever it's the hearing it it's the listening to it of the the word appearing in front of you you are you are opening up yourself to not only a history and a culture but to engage to be i mean there's a wonderful I'm, i don't want to go off track but my favorite filmmaker is a japanese filmmaker called koryada and an essay about him says he wants you to be in the world and i think reading the words it puts you in the world, it puts you in the Wiradjuri world. And why that's relative to what you said, I think I was actually just listening and thinking, the people in my family who are most damaged by the trauma of family violence are the members of my family, sadly, who don't speak about this and who have cut themselves off. And on Tuesday when I was going to Geelong, on, and Tara is aware of this, my younger brother died very suddenly three months ago now and I've been in a real difficult state and I was walking down to get the train and I was in one of those states where I didn't want to go. I was just feeling tired and I felt this thing where my body has just become really heavy and I just wanted to go home and sort of crawl up onto the bed and my Jack Russell crawls up next to me and licks me on, on the face <laughs> and, and, and then we go to sleep and I woke up okay but I didn't want to go and I knew there were people there who, you know, there was an event, there were some wonderful Wathurong people that I was going to talk to as well. But you know what happened to me? I got on the train and the train was packed. And because of school holidays, there were a lot of kids on the train, teenage kids mucking around and stuff. And by the time I got off at Geelong, I was reading a book. I actually felt so much better because I was with the world. I was on a train with all these people I didn't know and kids were being naughty and little kids were eating and, and you think, now this is where you need to be when you're going through difficulty and mm. not always on your own. I didn't have to talk to anyone, but by the time I got off the train, I, I actually felt re-energised and thought, I'm going <laughs> to talk to people at a library and I'm really happy about that. Whereas if I'd gone home, it might have relieved me in the short term, but it would do nothing for me in the long term. This is, this is a, a, a kind of slight tangent, J just related to what you said, Tony. I, I read a, a paper recently that said, because I, I read all sorts, I read weird books, frankly. That um, doesn't surprise me. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> There's, I read somewhere that, that said that talking to strangers it can actually be one of the best things you can do for a short-term boost of your, of your mood. Depends do you find that true? <laughs> <laughs> do you well, find that true? when I wrote my short story collection, Common People, it was based partly on that. And... You know, it sound, I don't want to sound patronising, but one of the stories in there is based on a, a homeless couple who were um, sleeping out in the doorway near my house in an old op shop that had closed down. And I'd gone past and I'd given them some money and, and then I thought, well, 
get people and this is not enough. So when I went back the next morning, I stopped, had a conversation. The mum was remarkable. We had, and you think, well, by in that those conversations, you just get a sense of these are people with a story, and their story matters. So I do think it. I, I actually do think it matters. Um, yeah, it's one of the things that Aboriginal people do that sometimes white fellows or non-Aboriginal people get a bit alarmed by that. Um, we had an event out of VU and a lot of aunties come and they're introduced to people and people are really polite and then they'll say, oh, where do you live? And the auntie will ask them, yeah, how many kids you got? Um, oh, when are you going to have another one? What? <laughs> Three's not enough. Why don't you have a fourth, <laughs> you know? And they'll say, I've only got a... Oh, it doesn't matter. you just got to put bunks in and then they'll go and they'll keep <laughs> probing but it's because they, they, they value those people. So, uh, th- yeah, I think it... I actually think it matters a lot. Um, it's probably one of the, um, yeah, it's one of the issues around, that I've written about around denialism. If we think about climate denialism or colonial violence denialism, I think that if we think about these issues in isolation from each other, they can weigh really heavy on people. So I can understand why people want to duck. And I think people who promote denialism, that's what they want to do. I, I, I've, I've said for a long time, the climate denialists in government, I don't know if they believe in it or not, it's a strategy to get to justify an action so everyone becomes petrified. Whereas if you, when I started doing my climate work in my day job and you start talking to people and you realise there are many people who think this is a serious issue, you become energised rather than debilitated. So, I, yeah, I think talking is... Um, Important, and as people by now have realised, I, I talk too much anyway. <laughs> do, you, do you like talking to random strangers, Sarah? Or do you, and do you get the similar satisfaction from talking in front of an audience like this? No, no, it's not the same. <laughs> <laughs> um, I could talk all night if you want to stay longer. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> but actually, it has been huge. Tony and I have both lost our brothers recently. Um, and that's been a huge part of my healing, is being able to just... And especially in Australia where it's more accessible to talk to people and to talk about your feelings really openly, for some people. But I've been talking constantly and is it a distraction or am I mining into something and healing something? I'm not really sure. I don't know if it's a difficult topic. Sometimes it takes talking about nothing for a long time to get to them. It's like you have to practice using your tongue. So I don't know. I mean, it is it is with the issue with grief. Obviously, I think there's a really uh, well. I think there's something really particular about the value of our community. That when this happened to me, the unconditional and ongoing support I've had from other Aboriginal people, including yourself, has been remarkable. And that was that's in the workplace as well. And in my previous workplace, the University of Melbourne, which I have railed against in, in endlessly for four years, but it is interesting. I, w- I said to my wife, I'm glad if I had been working there when this happened, I don't think I could go to work because people, again, they're polite and they, they wish you the best. I'm not suggesting they don't, but it's not the same. It's not the same understanding. So I've had, I've had real understanding. And I think, again, about that inclusiveness, um, I mean, it's, it was terrible for me to hear about what happened to Tara and there's nothing like, oh, well, there's someone else it's happened to. It's not that. It's just that you need to know that this is not something that you're experiencing alone um, so that one of the things, and this legitimately takes it back to the book, one of the things that I that happened in the book is that you have a man, a policeman, who thinks he can treat an Aboriginal girl in the way that he wishes to, and that would be otherwise normalised in the eyes of that society, but you have another character, a white man, Henry Lamb, who sees any ill treatment of Aboriginal people as illogical. So one of the things we need to do and... I do in fiction and in life is to say, well, what we think is acceptable at any time in history 
was not acceptable because there were other people who didn't accept it. So when people talk about the treatment of Aboriginal people in the 60s or the 30s, oh, that was the way people behaved and thought then. Well, it wasn't. Yeah. There were people, there were non-Aboriginal people in the 30s and the 60s who actually said, no, this is not the way to be a civil society. So even in the time, it wasn't that this was just acceptable, that there were people speaking out about what was regarded as a crime against humanity. So that conversation in the sense of listening to people and having people around you, I think in, in, in fiction and in life, is, it is vital. You can become really debilitated. Once you feel isolated, you're, real, you're in real trouble. Yeah. Which is, um, again, it's... The, uh, I've been looking for um, things in that your books have in common. And one that uh, it, it took me ages to realise, even though it's as obvious as the nose on my face, both of your um, younger protagonists have um, mothers who are absent but not dead. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Which I, th I found interesting. Oh, yeah. Mm. I, have, I, have, I was really... Um, I always stop when I'm reading a book because you've got my daughter's name in there, mm. Lilla. And so it's been really hard to finish. And confronting, but just that name. There's, I find it really difficult, maybe because um, I, uh, my mum's really sensitive, but I find it difficult to... I feel like that relationship's too close to talk about, and so I'll end up taking her character and putting her into an auntie or, an, or mm. a grandmother or someone else. And yeah. I kind of... There's that... But there is a, I feel, perhaps, I don't tell me if I'm wrong, but it feels like there is a little bit of a lost generation there. Oh, yeah. I, well, I think it's interesting. There is a, that, you're t I think you, we're talking about a very damaged generation. And um, although in both books you have these remarkable older Aboriginal people, um, Poppy and Odette, recovering and, and binding a community together through their work or through their actions, they're also part of a community of which they're, you, you, know, you use the word trauma, where there's incredible loss and damage. So that in my book, um, the character Dolores, who's a minor character, you know, while we have someone like Ajet who manages to protect and hold on to her granddaughter Sissy, we know that throughout this novel, there are other Aboriginal people who have lost everything and in Dolores's case, that loss just becomes overwhelming. And to be honest to the, the book and to be honest to the women in it, it was necessary to do that because not only do you have people forget sometimes you know, when you think of stolen or lost generations, you, it's a, it's a two-way process where you have children spending their lives looking for parents that they sometimes never find and you have parents spending their lives looking for children that they never find and in both cases we often hear about the successes of you know finding people but in most cases I think in most cases Aboriginal people who have searched for family never find them and people forget about that so there is that sense of w that great absence or loss and the balance for me and the difficulty for me was that while Lilla is gone, I didn't want the book to in any way indicate that that was a fault of hers. Yeah. And I was, I mean, look, I don't deal with my reviewers at all. My first book, I got a bad review of one review and I wrote to my publisher and said I was going to metaphorically cut his head off and put it in a box and <laughs> he suggested I not do that. Um, <laughs> but... One reviewer of this book said, just as a throwaway line, that Lilla abandons her daughter. She doesn't abandon her at all. She, she has to run because she's been suffered great violence. Yes. And it's a terrible indictment to, to make a claim about any Aboriginal woman who, for whatever reason, has been separated from a child. Um, and also, um, there's a, I suppose there's also a, something to connect for both your books again, which is also connects to my family experience, which is, um, uh, Tony, um, you've got the concept of 
exemption certificates and the consequences of those. And the consequences of exemption under law, good for people who out of the US who don't know this, is people who are exempt from Aboriginal Protection Acts across the entire of Australia pretty much could have no further contact with their family by law, with their, of their older family or their family of the same age. You can have contact with the kids, but not their parents or their siblings generally. And that was, of course, the experience of my family. That was why my grandfather was exempted from the act and therefore had no contact with his family. Um, do you think that the separation from, of, from family in that way, the, the voluntary separation to protect from children, was as harmful as being forcibly taken from family? My character was forcibly taken and then the only way he got to take, to return back to country was to return as a worker. Mm -hmm. Uh, to p return as a farmhand and didn't and he, and then worked still for the white fella on that country and yeah they're dispossessed of the country of their land all the way through um should i explain what the book's about should we both do that <laughs> yeah I think, <laughs> I think you should do that <laughs> okay just because we're talking, has anyone read our books? <laughs> um, I wanted to talk about the whole of Australia and I was going too wide for 10 years and so then I needed to focus on a small amount of space. I'll try and do this fast, I'm watching the timer and I'm sorry. Um, and so when I compacted the whole of Australia into 500 acres, then uh, it made it easier, obviously. And they, it's 500 acres of Wiradjuri country on the banks of the fictional Murrumbi River. And there's three narrative strands. One is Poppy Albert Gondawindi, who's about to die and wants to leave a legacy for his family um, through a dictionary and tell his story as, as a boy and also basically um, to tell the story of all time on that 500 acres. And so he's a time traveler and he's been visiting the ancestors and initiated as a man and he has all this cultural information. But I also wanted to write it as if Poppy, I don't know if you got this from the book, was actually writing a handbook for native title. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. <laughs> and then- The only bit I didn't get was me in the book. Because you're female in the book. <laughs> A good female. And then there's um, his granddaughter, August, who we were talking about before, who returns for the funeral. And so she's narrating the contemporary action, which is about mining um, a mine coming onto the land and uh, keeping that family intact and the kind of t the issue of artifacts and what actually is when you scratch that surface of our land, especially Wiradjuri country, which actually looks like nothing. It looks like fields with some granite boulders in the distance. And for most people, they wouldn't see everything that this family see. And so she's narrating that story. And then I knew having two family members telling that history of the, of the land, I needed to tell the history of colonization in Australia and lands being missions and stations and our incarceration in a sense. And so that's where Reverend Greenleaf who is at the end of his life too, in 1915, World War One, reflecting back on him actually opening the mission back on that 500 acres. And he is only able to have a, a reflective perspective because he's a Lutheran German and being persecuted for his own mother tongue in 1915. So that's the book. Tony, you should plug yours now. No, no, that's, mine's a little bit like that, but different. They're both really good and you should read them. <laughs> That's what I think. Do we talk some more? Do you yeah, I'd like Tony. Tony, please Go tell on, Tony. us because it's nice. It's a nice thing. <laughs> Go on, Tony. Okay. Um, my book's, <laughs> my book's um, about um, Scott Morrison. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how do you do that? Um, well, essentially what my book is about is um, an Aboriginal grandmother and granddaughter living in a, a fictional rural town in regional Australia in 1963. Um, Odette is very protective of, of Sissy, a 13-year-old girl, and a new policeman comes to town, a Sergeant Lowe, 
who was not only very officious but quite pathological in his in his intents and his intention is to remove all so-called mixed blood children from the community of which there aren't that many left it's a dying town and he certainly targets young sissy who is also as a developing girl coming to the attention of a white youth in the town who also has um, a terrible history of violence behind him but also quite um, violent intentions towards the girl. Um, so at some point in the novel, about halfway, um, Odette makes the decision that she has to escape the town in order for Sissy to be saved or to be protected. It's then really about what happens to them with who they engage with on the road. But the essential elements or the driving force for the novel are one that I, I wanted to write a book that highlighted the courage of women, Aboriginal women, to keep family together, the tenacity of someone like Odette representing the experience of women in some way. I wanted to um, give some understanding of the hypocrisy and contradictions of Yorick's know, um, Exemption Act's various forms of identity politics at the time in Australia. The other thing that was really, though, important to me was to uh, write a novel which, at its heart, was a novel of tenderness. So there's no or very little direct violence in the novel. There's inferred violence in, in, in the past. But um, I was driven by a desire to write a novel which conveyed the love between a granddaughter and a, a grandmother. And to do that with a lot of, I think, a lot of intimacy. And I talked about this last night in, in Brunswick. There's a bath on the front of the book. And every time I say the bath scene, people think it's sort of a, I'm about to launch into a sort of Hitchcock horror story. The bath scene is a chapter where, um, in the first bath scene, there are several bath scenes, where um, Sissy has a bath and Odette washes her hair. Um, there's a scene later when Odette has a bath and Sissy washes her hair. And it's a very slow chapter which is fixates or get, draws attention to that tactile relationship between the, the older woman and the granddaughter, the, the physical intimacy, the platonic sensuality of that and the love in that. So that um, I talked before about growing up in a very violent household but I also remember the incredible physical touch of women in my life, my, my mother and grandmother and my older sister. And even now, it would be to her embarrassment, but my favourite um, memory of my sister is having a bath with her, which is a bit old now. We're both in our 60s. We, we don't do it anymore. <laughs> um, but I still love getting in the bath with my, my big sister. And when my kids were born, we, as my daughter said at the launch, family baths are like, the big birch tradition and my daughter told a terrible story which was so funny about her, her poor husband Nick who was there with my grandkids when she asked her husband Nick to give my granddaughter Isabel her first bath and they were busy Siobhan said to Nick I just put Isabel in the bath with you and Nick being from Ringwood which is a I think a Protestant stronghold in Melbourne <laughs> Nick said you want me to put her in the bath with me she said, yeah, you bath her when you're in the bath. He goes, you sure? She goes, yeah. So when she went into the bathroom, Nick was in the bath with his daughter, but he had his um, underpants on. <laughs> and my daughter said, we don't, we, we don't do underpants, <laughs> Nick. <laughs> so essentially, it's, I hope that it's about, in the end, a novel about love, not a lo love overcoming that, love overcoming that violence that, that Aboriginal people who have had to face for, for far too long. Can I say something? I didn't even notice the bathtub on the front, but the notes that I've made at the front of the book, because it's in pencil, I rub it off. You I still, you've you've but, vandalised the book. Yeah. <laughs> but literally, I wrote, tender people touch so easily. There you go. The way people touch so easily is exactly what I got from the book. And then also... Like, we didn't discuss this before. It looked set up, but we didn't. But we also, did. <laughs> it says at the bottom, a hand running through bath water. Mm. Yeah, you've captured that 
that beauty of touch and that that balm of just reaching out and holding mm. someone and feeling that warm water and care the care of a bath the care of of nurture so yeah. beautifully and may i say i can say even more I mean, you can say that again if you want. <laughs> I can say even more wonderful things about Tara's books. First of all, I say I don't write in her books. Um, I don't van <laughs> I don't vandalise Tara's books. I, I actually revere them. Let let me let me return the the. This is a as we say in um, on Wurundjeri country. This is a, a ceremony of Tandurum where what happens under Tandurum is that the the traveller comes to the country of local people and the traveller offers a gift and then we give sanctuary to the local person but more than that we give them a greater gift in return. Um, not only in this book of Tara's and I, it didn't surprise me at all by the way the issue of language being so important and the dictionary becoming such a focal point of the novel. One of my children, my youngest daughter Nina is at Melbourne University doing Aboriginal writing as one of her subjects and she came home a couple of months ago and I said what are you going to do for your final paper and she held up a book Swallow the Air and she said this is a novel by Tara June Winch, do you know her? And then I said yeah I know her and I, when she knew how well I knew you she, she was just besotted. So I reread Swallow the Air because I knew Nina would then ask me to look over her paper and would I get it right. The only time I've helped her too much, she got a bad mark, by the way. <laughs> um, and one of the things that, re that I've reintroduced me to in your work, Tara, is that it's not only your love of language and your respect for language, I actually think that what links those two books around language is the incredible, unique use of language in your work. So you, you put words together that shouldn't work together. And I think that, how old were you when you wrote the first book? 21. 21. That's, I mean, I don't want to hear that. That's, that's just wrong. <laughs> that's wrong. <laughs> so when you read Swallow the Air, you see phrases and sentences that are so profound and so beautiful and poetic. And you just think, if I put those five words together, I'd, I'd fuck it up and put them in the wrong order and someone would say, that doesn't work. She has the capacity to use language in a way that I don't, I've never seen in another writer. She's a five-star. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can I, is that, if I, is that enough? Yeah, that's enough. Okay. <laughs> that, that, was a, that was quite an epic suck-up. Yeah. <laughs> but, but seemingly quite honest. So. And I left the script at home. <laughs> I know, that was, that was well done. No, I'm serious, it's... Um, if it, I think it's worth saying, and Claire's got a new book coming out in September and we'll be in conversation yes. at reading sometime in September. Yep. I agreed yeah. to today. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this I, found, I found out today. It one was. of the <laughs> things that I, we, and I know that Tara did mention this in something I heard recently. This is, oh, no, Tara spoke about, we got about a minute to go, so I'm going to say hog this as I have all night. Hog away. Um, Tara said at the conversation with Maxine Beniba Clark, she remembers the days when you would go to a writers' festival and yeah, there'd be a tent of 4,000 lunatics want to see Matthew Riley over there <laughs> and you'd be sitting there on your own or with three or four people who you're related to, all of them in the audience. <laughs> and that's another binder book, cuz, can you give me one? <laughs> um, but now there are, we are such a troop of Aboriginal writers, so every time you go to a festival, you're never on your own. There's always other Aboriginal writers around you. We always support each other. And now when we do events where people are, are coming because the writing, it's in such a energetic, we're in such a remarkable phase that um, it's, it's a moment like no other, I think, for us. Yeah. And of course, we're blessed by people like Pop who we've inherited that value from, but it's... I mean, you must feel this as well, Claire. It's yeah, I, think I feel that we, we also tend to um, drag each other up the ladder. When one of us gets to an event, the first thing we do is think which other black fella can we have in the event with us. That's what I do. Yeah. That's what I do too. Yeah. <laughs> and look well, that's zero minutes left.
<laughs> Thank you all for coming tonight and listening to these two great authors. Give them a round of applause. Um, they'll be, their books are sale at the back and these two lovely people will be signing books. Um, and they'll probably be happy to have a chat as well. Um, thank you very much.